Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just give it a couple of seconds so everyone can get on. My name is uh, Keelan Ward. Hi, I'm Policy Manager at IFOA in charge of pensions. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this IFOA webinar today. Um, the topic that we're discussing today is uh, heterogeneous membership and decumulation only CDC plans. And I practiced saying that without messing it up like five times. Um, the good thing is we have a hundred, over 150 of you joined today. So thank you very much. Um, you're very welcome. The thing I would say is before we kick off is that all questions will be at the end of the presentation. But please don't hesitate to use the chat box in the Q&A function as we'll be monitoring it and we'll pick it up and we'll try and get to as many as we can. Uh, the other point being that if, if there's nothing that if there's something that doesn't get answered today, that we'll, we'll definitely pick that up at the end or email back to the person. But yeah, please feel free to engage with the questions box. We do like it when there's a lively discussion. Uh, I think I'll introduce our speaker today is Professor Catherine Donnelly. Catherine's a professor in the Department of Actuarial Mathematics and Statistics at Harriet Watt and the director of the Risk Insight Lab. Uh, she's a qualified actuary who's previously worked in the pensions industry. Catherine has a PhD from the University of Waterloo, Canada, and an MSc from the University of Oxford, with an MA from the University of Cambridge. Her research interests lie in pensions and life insurance, and she's published widely in these areas. Uh, she was a member of the USS Joint Expert Panel in 2018, and Catherine has a keen interest in developing workable solutions to improve people's financial situation in retirement. Um, and I think at this point, I'll hand over to you, Catherine, if you don't mind. Thank you very much, Caelan. Well, it's a real pleasure to be able to share some of my recent research results with you. So what I'm going to tell you about is um, heterogeneity in a particular type of collective defined contribution plan. That's a decumulation only solution and people are only sharing longevity risk. Now, basically the, the um, idea of what I'm looking at is if you have people who have uh, different amounts of money joining such plans, does that make a difference to income volatility? And the broad answer is not really most of the time. Um, so the, the general conclusion is the more the merrier to join such a longevity risk sharing plan. And it's only in certain specific cases that it's not um, good to have heterogeneity. Um, and those are cases when the fund, the number of people in the fund is, is really very, very small. But we'll discuss the details later on. Now, first of all, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the program. So the program has been running for a few years now. So just, oh, just move here across to the next slide. Here we go. Oh, I think I skipped one. So the research program is on optimizing future pension plans. Um, it will shortly be finishing up the research. And um, we still got a couple of webinars to go though. So one strand of the research has been focusing on pooled annuity funds. And these can be run as a type of uh, collective defined contribution scheme in retirement only. So the idea is that people join them with their pension savings, having been in been in a DC pension plan before retirement, and then um, their pension savings, that lump sum, is converted into an income stream for life. In pooled annuity funds, though, we are pulling only longevity risk, and we're not doing any investment risk sharing. Right. So the, the pooled annuity funds, I'm I am defining as something that pulls longevity risk only. There are other types of uh, decumulation collective defined contribution schemes that may also do investment risk sharing. I'm, I'm not considering those within the pooled annuity fund stream. The other uh, strand of research looks in more generally at coll collective defined contribution schemes. So in particular, we focused on, the, on a scheme that's similar to the Royal Meal um, collective pension plan that will shortly be in existence and we were um, trying to understand what are the um, the sources of investment risk sharing and who's perhaps benefiting and not benefiting from investment risk sharing so you can explore more of that um, in the outputs of the uh, program that you can find on the actuaries website under the actual research center uh, part of the site and you can see papers and uh, watch earlier webinars I've done on these topics but now let's turn to what we're going to look at today. So first of all, I'm going to spend some time about why I think pooled annuity funds are really something we should be looking at. We'll then spend some time looking at how do they actually work, right? So how would you go about, about um, sharing longevity risk? Like what does that mean in financial terms? And then we'll look at the results on heterogeneity. So when everybody's not a perfect copy of each other, 
does that really matter? And we're really looking at understanding what's going on within that setting so you can get the idea rather than just showing you some numbers. Okay, so the, the um, situation is that we have um, almost 23 million people in the UK saving into workplace pension. And automatic enrollment um, has been a great success since it started in uh, 2012. We have now about 80% of all employees with some kind of workplace pension. Right, so you can see that from the chart here. So we have the calendar year um, going up to uh, 2021 on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, we have the percentage or proportion of employees with a workplace pension by type of pension. So the top line there um, relates to the total people in a workplace pension. You may not be able to see very well this, this chart depending on how you're looking at this presentation, but basically what we also see is that um, more people are saving into some sort of defined contribution arrangement. And that means that they are saving into a pension pot and it's not designed that that uh, pension pot to give them an income for life so in retirement so whenever they come to retirement they're going to have to make a decision about what they do with their pension savings and what I'm going to uh, argue is that uh, pooled annuity funds should be a complement to the two main existing options they have of converting their pension savings into an income at retirement the two main existing options being income drawdown and a life annuity. Now we also see, um, so you can, there's lots of really nice data on the, on the ONS website. Um, if you compare people who are saving into a DC pension plan compared to a DB pension plan, um, they have estimates of, of the um, amount of money people have saved within that. And the broad message, whether you can see these numbers or not very well, is that people in DC pension savings have significantly less, um, a significant, significantly smaller amount of money than people who are saving in a defined country, defined benefit pension scheme, right? So they're saving a lot less. And I'm, I'm sure given the audience today, we know the reasons for that. So there's just a lot less money going into DC pension plans, for example, right? So people aren't saving enough for their retirement, at least relative to the DB pension plans. Um, and I'm sure we can also, um, we've also seen several reports coming out from various companies um, in the industry saying people are not saving enough, right? So, and this is also at least seen in a relative sense compared to the DB pension plan, DC savers are not saving enough. Um, in terms of, is there a demand for an income in retirement? Well, this is one survey um, results we can see. So this is a survey from um, Aon from their DC member survey from about almost 10 years ago now actually and um, but you can find very similar surveys so we just look at one so they're asking people what do they want to do with their pension fund in retirement and a large proportion of people they ask want it to have a stable income over their lifetime right so a stable income for like for their lifetime so this is saying that there is a demand for this so we're we're just focusing on a particular vehicle that's going to give people an income for life Okay, and there's a, sorry, that was another similar type of survey. Um, it's a more of an internet-based survey, but perhaps more recent. Um, and again, similar kind of things. People were concerned um, in retirement about running out of money and things like the rising cost of living, which will, I'm sure, this was a survey done in 2019. There'll be a much higher proportion of people worried about the rising cost of living um, today, as we can well imagine. So the summary of what the data and various surveys tell us um, is that we have a typical DC pension saver who works in the private sector because people in the public sector um, continue to have generally DB pension provision. And the typical DC pension saver who's in the private sector doesn't have very much in terms of their pension savings. They want an income for life. Um, so the questions are, how are we going to give them that income for life? How are we going to give them enough income for life, right? So pre-retirement, we can try to perhaps find ways of increasing contributions, perhaps making explicit the link between the income they're getting in retirement and how that relates to the contributions we're making instead of um, presenting contribution rates in a default way, right? So, so whenever you're joining your pension scheme, you're given a form and you're asked to take what contribution rate do you want to do? You'll be guided by what is a um, default contribution rate in the fund, 
or the maximum that my uh, employer will match with that because you don't know what what to contribute so you'll probably use that as a guidance so perhaps we can find better ways using computers um, to try to encourage people to contribute at a sum that's um, more realistic for their, their retirement income needs. And then how, how also do we give them value for money, right? Because they, they won't have very much money. So we need their money, their pension savings to work as hard as possible. So I do think that pooled annuity funds should be sitting out there as a, as a solution for people. Right, so pooled annuity fund, there are people maybe use different words for this, um, but I'm going to define it as this, right? So in a pooled annuity fund, people are joining at retirement with their lump sum pension contributions, right? So you retire from your DC pension plan, and instead of taking your money and say buying a life annuity or taking your money and um, buying some kind of drawdown product, or maybe just withdrawing all your money, instead you could contribute at least part of it to your pooled annuity fund. Then from this pooled annuity fund, they'll take your money, they'll invest it, and they'll pay you an income for life in retirement, right? But that income is not a guaranteed income in the same way a life annuity is. It's, it's riskier. So it may go up or down, but it's not as risky as income drawdown, right? So an income drawdown, if you um, cannot just live off the natural income from your pension savings. So if you have to eat into the capital value of your pension savings, income drawdown is very risky because you can run out of money in retirement. The downside, of course, is the pooled annuity fund is with any longevity risk sharing arrangement. So that includes uh, life annuities and defined benefit pensions and payment. That once you start having your, um, your income being paid because it's longevity risk sharing, if you die, your money is given up to the other people in the pool. So that's the, the downside of it. But in return, you have this um, much more certainty about your income for life. And, you'll, and you should get a much higher income than a kind of income drawdown situation, assuming you have the same investment strategy. Now, I argue that really we should be focusing on sharing longevity risk, right? So it makes a lot of sense because um, there are two elements of longevity risk. There's the idiosyncratic longevity risk and systematic longevity risk. And idiosyncratic longevity risk, you might also know it as random fluctuations risk. You can reduce that by pooling, right? By having a lot of people together, you can reduce that and eliminate that with enough people, right? So by pooling risk, longevity risk, we can eliminate that. And that is the basis of um, insurance companies, so life insurance companies are, are um, run on the principle of pooling longevity risk through, through life annuities and term insurance products. Other insurance companies work on pooling different risks, right? So house insurance and all those sorts of things work on pooling different risks. But this is a risk we know we can do by pooling, right? That's a, the, um, the fundamental underpinning of the actuarial industry. The, the, fund, the people in the fund will still be left with systematic longevity risk. Right? But they would have that anyway, in some sense, they would have a different form of it in a fund compared to being an individual, but they would still have some sort of systematic longevity risk. And we have another paper from the um, program where we study the impact of systematic longevity risk um, on, on a pooled fund. So you can watch the webinar on that on the program deliverables website. But overall, by pooling longevity risk, by sharing it, we have an overall reduction in longevity risk. I would argue that with investment risk sharing, you don't have this reduction in risk with investment risk sharing. You're, you're, you're literally sharing it across uh, generations of people, but you're not eliminating it, right? But longevity risk, you do eliminate longevity risk through pulling, right? You, you eliminate the idiosyncratic risk. So it makes a lot of sense to do that. Now, we have some real world examples of pulled annuity funds. They may not be called that, but, but we have some, I'll talk about two very recent ones. And um, now I'm going to present the way a, let's say a very standard or, you know, theoretical or simple pooled annuity fund can work. I don't think that's the ultimate solution in reality. And we can see here two examples uh, that have been implemented in practice and, um, and work, you know, in a way to suit their customers. So we have one QSuper, and I'm, I'm sure you can easily find information uh, online about that. So they have um, people joining this, um, their thing called a lifetime pension. They pull their, um, 
their money together to give them an income for life. And they give, you know, very standard benefits, so um, joint life income. They also have uh, something called a money back protection, right? So if you contribute your pension savings and they'll pay you, say, um, some money, then they'll, so let, maybe I'll just put in some numbers, right? So say you contribute $100,000 in this case to the QSuper lifetime pension. And say after a number of years, um, they have paid you a total of $80,000. So, and they don't accumulate those $80,000 payments. They just say $100,000 you initially contributed, contributed less $80,000 in payments we made to, made to you. And if you died, we will pay your state $20,000, right? So that um, is probably quite attractive to people because they, they don't have this feeling of, well, I'll lose all my money if I die, right? So that addresses that um, issue. And we'll see there's a similar thing with this other type of fund called Endeavity Pension Fund. Um, so they do some sort of hedging in, in order to do that money back protection. In another type of fund that's, that we've seen launched, um, I think it was this year, it was either this year or the end of last year, called Longevity Pension Fund in Canada, I think it's in Canada. Um, they do a different type of pooling, right? So they also have a kind of money back protection, um, but what they do is they, they don't pull the initial pension savings that people bring to the, to the Longevity Pension Fund, they pull the cumulative positive investment returns, right? So looking at pulling the, the investment returns and they give a similar money back protection, but not quite as strong, right? So any invest, cumulative investment losses are borne by individuals in the fund and they would get back a little bit less if they had some cumulative um, loss in the fund, right? But they're, they're addressing, let's say, concerns of people in terms of their structure and they're not the kind of uh, structured exactly the way I've structured a pooled fund here, the kind of, let's say, the very standard standard fund. Um, but you can take the fund I've been looking at and you can use the same ideas and build whatever product suits your customers' needs. Okay, and there's other examples of pooled annuity funds. Again, maybe not just called that, but they do exist in the, in the world. Right, so what are the, the financial benefits of pooling longevity risk? Okay, so here we have a... a uh, a death table, probability of death table. So on the horizontal axis, we have age X running from age 65 to age 120. And on the vertical axis, we have the annual probability of death. And the dots show you, show you the annual probability of death at each age, right? So we see it's very low at age 65, and then it's um, increasing um, up, up, up. And then at age 120, everybody in this particular uh, mortality table is assumed to be dead at age 120. Okay, so we've all, if, for all actuaries, we've all seen this in our first actuarial life insurance course, this type of thing, or, or um, life tables course. So the interpretation, if you're doing longevity sharing, is that we can reinterpret this table, this graph, as the annual expected return due to longevity risk sharing, right? So if you have a group of people who pulled a longevity risk, um, at age 65, or there could be many people of all ages pulling their longevity risk. We don't have to have everybody the same age. Then their annual probability of death is effectively their expected return due to longevity risk, risk sharing. So someone who's age 65 can expect a return of only about 1% due to longevity risk sharing because they're unlikely to die. And that reflects the, their um, risk of, of dying, the return they get due to their unlikely risk of dying. Someone who's age 85 would have an annual expected return due to longevity risk sharing of about 11%. And that's the same as their chance of dying, right? So these returns are, are the returns due to longevity risk sharing. That's our interpretation. We're unlikely to get these sort of returns due to investment returns. Um, so it really is quite a, a huge benefit. In terms of structuring your pooled annuity fund, right? So Typically, um, but what I'm going to look at, and typically what we see in, say, life annuities, is that um, the income is structured so that we get a, a level income over time, right? Or you could have an inflation increasing it, income over time. But what, we, what, we're, what we're doing in terms of calculating a level income is that we are anticipating those future returns due to longevity risk sharing, the longevity credits, we'll call them. 
You can, of course, structure a fund so that you don't anticipate them and you're just paying an increasing income over time as and when you get the longevity credits from people who've died in the fund, you just um, give that out to the survivors and you don't pay an income that's trying to be stable over time. However, in that case, it's probably perhaps less attractive to people because they're looking at lower, lower um, income when they're younger and then higher income when they're older. And we can see just from sales of um, life annuities, if you compare sales of inflation index life annuities to level life annuities, despite most people saying they want an inflation indexed income, 90% of them will buy the, the level annuity as opposed to the inflation indexed income because the uh, inflation index income is maybe half of the, the level life annuity um, annual income when, when they start out, when they first buy the annuity product. Okay, so in terms of risk to the individual, um, the argument is that these longevity risk sharing structures that we're considering, including this, this pooled annuity fund, is lying between income drawdown and life annuity in terms of risk to the individual. All right, so in this chart we have here on the horizontal axis, increasing investment risk borne by the individual, and on the, the vertical axis, increasing longevity risk borne by the individual. So income drawdown, the individual bears all of their their risk, all, their, all of their longevity risk, and they can choose how much investment risk they want through their investment strategy. In life annuities, we're generally in the bottom left corner here with the lowest amount of investment risk, the lowest longevity risk. Most of it, most of the time it's transferred all of it to the insurance company, and but you can get variants of life annuities that maybe um, allow the annuitant to bear some investment risk and possibly also some longevity risk. And what we're trying to do is span this gap with these longevity risk sharing structures. Right? And this is also why when I'm looking at this, I'm trying to break down the longevity credit into an explicit calculation so that we have a lot more flexibility about what we do. So I will show you how, how we've calculated the longevity credit in this case and for a single life um, income. In order to give a single life income, we'll also have a webinar shortly about joint life income and how would you calculate an explicit longevity credit for a joint life income. And it's just to give that flexibility in terms of building up these longevity sharing structures so that it can be tailored to the needs of the customer and the, and the company offering it. Okay, so we're going to, we're getting closer and closer to what, how does it actually work, right? So a pooled annuity fund, just to summarize, so it's just a structure to pull longevity risk and pay a regular income for life. And in this fund, everybody's gonna become a beneficiary of each other, right? So when someone dies, what we're gonna do is share out the account value of that individual, the amount of money they have in the fund, we share it out among the survivors in the fund. And that is really just a direct manifestation of what anyway happens in a life annuity contract and really in a defined benefit scheme as well. It's just all hidden away in a calculation, but it's really in there, it's just not explicit. And we're just going to make that explicit. And we do that, and why would we do this? Um, because we can get higher on a lifelong income compared to income drawdown, right? So um, you, you will, an individual in the fund will get investor returns on their on the money they invest in the fund they'll get investor returns and on top of that we'll get these payments from people who've died in the fund called longevity credits and um, again how you express that can be done in different ways you can look at qsuper and the other one um to see how they've done it but we're just going to do it in a very explicit way and um, so they'll get they'll get a higher return than say under income drawdown because you get this longevity credit. And this longevity credit is in worst case zero when nobody else dies and otherwise it'll be strictly positive. But the flip side is that if, if I'm in the fund and I die, then I give up my fund to everybody else. So that's my kind of loss, why I incur my loss. But while I'm, I'm alive, I benefit from um, others dying in the fund. So it's supporting that higher payment and lifelong payment. And while theoretically in a perfect world, um, it should be the same as a life annuity. Of course, life isn't perfect and we can't get exactly the investment returns we might assume in our life annuity and so on. And there, there are guarantees um, built into life annuities and capital requirements around life annuities. And that all adds on to the cost of life annuities. Um, so it's like the, the uh, cost of all the guarantees in the life annuity. So what we may do is avoid um, all or some of the costs in the life annuity and therefore pay our customer a higher expected income. Again, the downside is that the customer is paying more, it's getting 
uh, it has more risk in terms of their income. Their income is more volatile than in a life annuity, which is generally stable, very, very flat. So they may get less than what they would have gotten a life annuity overall, right? But we think that is um, well, it's possible, um, but overall it should be um, less likely. But again, the risk remains. We could also put in guarantees in our pooled annuity fund. We don't have to add in the full guarantees of a life annuity. We could do partial guarantees. And how could we implement it? So I, I've mentioned before that in the name of the presentation about a, a decumulation only CDC plan, perhaps this is the most likely way it would be implemented in the UK. And it's not entirely clear, but it could be done as a post um, retirement decumulation only, in other words, CDC plan, or it could perhaps be a retail fund offered by an insurance company. Right, so these are possible ways of doing it in practice, offering it to people. Now let's, let's start moving towards the, the heterogeneity part. So this will, we're going to look at some uh, equations. So hopefully that won't put people off, right? So the question is, if we've got a group of identical, identical people here, identical copies of each other, are they the same, of, same as a group of people here, not identical copies? Now, what I'm getting at here is that if you look at the academic uh, studies on this, it nearly always assumes everybody is, a, is an independent and identical copy of each other. So that means that if they join one of these funds, they join at the same age, um, they have the same future distribution of deaths and they have the same fund, fund value when they join. So my question is, does it really matter if they were different? And what we'll see is, as I said at the beginning, not really, it doesn't matter. What matters most is that there are lots of people in the fund, right? That's the thing that matters most rather than the differences. There are caveats around that and, and we'll see that. So we'll just um, get an idea of how to do the, the longevity credit calculation by just trying to fix all these ideas in people's minds, right? So when someone, uh, so this is a sort of account structure idea of how this fund could run. It may not be as appropriate um, for the customer. It might be better to do just um, an income-based approach. Just tell the customer you're getting this income and we're going to make adjustments every year to that. Um, so it depends on, on um, yeah, what sits the customers basically, but I'll just look at it as an account structure. So this could always run internally. So the someone who joins this fund, they join with some initial account value. So that's in other words, their pension savings. That's invested. Their, their account value to earn investment returns and they'll gain investment returns. They'll make withdrawals, so that's here in, in red, right? So the income withdrawals and I'm suggesting that generally they should be told how much they can withdraw. They, they don't get to choose how much they, they withdraw. And so up to this point, it sounds very much like income drawdown, apart from the perhaps um, not allowing them to withdraw whatever they like. The main difference is in these longevity credits, right? So these are the things that are the share of the funds of people who have died. So at worst case, this longevity credit is zero, and otherwise it will be strictly positive when someone else in the fund dies or, or several people. However, when the individual who we're looking at here, whenever they die, they lose the entire net value of their account, and that is shared out to, to the remaining people in the fund as their um, longevity credit. So let's see, how could we calculate this, right? So we're going to look at a very unrepresentative, very small group of people, right? We'll just continue the, the Star Wars theme, right? So we've got five people um, who have joined a fund altogether. Now, I don't recommend it's only five people at all, but it's just um, how many pictures can we put onto this slide? And we're going to get an idea of the calculation, right? So we're going to look at one particular way of doing the calculation. There are many varieties of it, but we're going to do a calculation that is consistent with the way we calculate the annuity value that is used to get to calculate the income, right? So we've got five people in this fund and they're all uh, different, right? And so someone's going to die over the year and we'll just look at things on an annual basis. Someone's going to die over the year and what we want to do is see how could we share out their account value among the four survivors, right? So unfortunately, Mr. Jin dies, right? So that might not be a surprise to anybody. If you're a Star Wars fan, right? So, right. So now we've got a little bit of notation, trying to keep it as light as possible, but the, but it is uh, just the nature of this to, to try and look at it. Okay, so we're just introducing some general notation. Don't worry too much if if you want to uh, 
ignore this part of the presentation about how do we actually do the calculation, but, but just for, to show those who are interested. So each participant, they have some age at the start of the year, can be a different age, they don't have to be the same age. They have some uh, known probability, we assign them a probability of dying over the year, and generally um, that probability reflects their age. Again, you could do a more tailored approach, taking into account other factors around the person but we'll just assume it's an age-based probability of dying over the year. And then we look at their account values at the end of the year. So that account value is basically their account value from the start of the year, less any, less any income paid out at the start of the year, and then you accumulate that net value with investment returns to the end of the year, right? So just accumulate at the actual investment returns earned on, the, on that account value, however it's invested. So uh, Mr. Jin has died, and we say want to calculate Han Solo's share of Mr. Jin's account value, right? So the idea is that, I mean, we're just using pictures, but I'll put in some uh, notation in the next slide. So basically we're going to look at how Han Solo compares to everybody who's still alive in the group, including himself, right? So he's, he's gonna get some fraction of Mr. Jin's account value and the fraction is gonna be determined in, how, determined in how he relates to everybody else in the fund in some way. Right, so we'll just look at that equation. So Han Solo, yeah, unfortunately he's got a bit older um, since uh, Star Wars first came out. So he's now age 80, or he was age 80 at the start of the year. And so we're going to calculate his, the fraction he gets of Mr. Jin's account value as follows, right? So we're going to take Han Solo's uh, account value at the start of the year, and we'll multiply, multiply by this fraction of his chance of dying, which is his, uh, QUT is chance of dying over the year divided by one minus QUT. And this is roughly speaking um, his expected loss over the year, right? So his expected loss is he loses his account value if he dies. And it's it's not quite Q times F because I'm, I'm doing this consistently with the annuity um, calculation. And we look at the same type of um, calculation, the Q divided by one minus Q times the fund value for everybody and we sum it over everybody and that's our denominator, right? So this is how we're gonna calculate the um, fund value when everybody is not the same. If everybody was the same, you can simplify this really easily. And um, so if everybody was the same in terms of age and, and so on and future probability of death or future or chance of dying over the year and this, they had the same fund value if they were alive, then you would just take Mr. Account's value and divide by four because there are only four survivors, right? So it'd be very straightforward. But whenever we have this heterogeneity, it just becomes a bit more complicated, but it's not, it's, it's really very straightforward still. Okay, so um, whoever's died in this case, Mr. Jin, Mr. Jin, we just share out his account value among everybody. And the way this fraction is constructed, his account value will be shared out entirely among the four survivors and there'll be nothing left over. So we and I, so we've, we've reached the end of the year. Um, we've observed Mr. Jin died, died, died during the year. He had an unfortunate accident with someone. And we want to calculate how much to pay to Han Solo, who's now age 81. He was 80 at the start of the year. He's now age 81. Um, how much should we pay him now? We just pay an annual income. So we take his fund value, Han Solo's fund account value at the end of the year. That was after investment returns, but before we add on the longevity credit. We add on that longevity credit from part of it due to Mr. Jin. And we divide that total value because that's it now the total account value of Han Solo, we divide by an appropriate annuity value. And we're just looking at a single life annuity here. I'm just using expected present value, right? So then we pay out whatever that value is, we pay that to Han Solo's income and we pay it from his account value. So then his account value is reduced by that amount of income. Okay, and we can do that for everybody. We just use an age appropriate annuity value for them. Um, now, this is a, just a, a sample pass um, from a particular fund, from a, actually another piece of work we did in the project, um, the one we were looking at, Systematic Longevity Risk. So this is a fund, which is an open fund. We had 100 people joining every year. And these are just three sample paths, so three possible outcomes in the unknown future um, from a pooled annuity fund where we ha had 100 people joining every year, right? So this is showing you um, this is starting from age 65 in this case. So in that particular study, we assumed everybody joined the fund at the same age, which is not, which is a reasonable assumption, right? So people are retiring at a say a known age, and um, whether it's 65 or 67 or 70. And uh, 
so the horizontal axis shows you the development of the income down three different sample paths from age 65 to 105. And then the income um, rate they're getting is on the vertical axis. Okay, so that's 100 people joining every year. Now, let's turn to our results, right, to try to understand the heterogeneity aspect. So we're just going to look first, uh, well, actually we're really just going to look here at the single cohort. So we've got a, a single group joining at time zero, nobody else joins, right, and we're just going to see how, what happens to the income for this group. Now, we assume that we're going to assume here, and we'll say, we'll say some results about when they're not the same age, but we're going to assume here that everybody's the same age and they, they have the same mortality distribution. And this is really going to help us um, to, let's say, understand what's going on better, right, by starting with this, this point. Now, I'm going to introduce some things, and I hope it's, I'm not going to lose everybody. Okay, so we're assuming everybody's the, the same, they all join at the same age, right? And we're going to assume that everybody's joining, first of all, with the same amount of money, right? So this is the, the kind of um, stormtrooper case where we've got all these independent and identical copies. Now, um, let's just, since everybody's the same, right? As long as they're alive anyway, uh, let income N be the income paid to survive at time N, right? So what we want to do is look at how does the income change over time? Right, so this won't be the ultimate thing we're looking at, but we're just going to make this observation. So how does the income change from, from year to year? Now, if we look at the change in income from year to year, and we assume constant investment returns, then we see that the annual change in income is driven purely by, in effect, idiosyncratic longevity risk. Right, so it's driven purely by, with constant investment returns, it's driven purely by um, the ratio of the true survival probabilities over that last year. If we're looking at the change in income since the income at the, at the start of the year, um, it's driven by the change in the, the true survival probability, right? So that's from our uh, distribution, divided by the survival probability observed among the people in the fund, right? And that is just due to idiosyncratic longevity risk. Because if we had you know, millions of people in the fund and they're all the same, then the empirical survival probability that we would observe among a group of millions of people would be the same as our true survival probability, assuming that there's no systematic longevity risk in our model, which we're going to assume, right? So we're just looking at idiosyncratic longevity risk. If we relax this assumption of constant investment returns, we would have a similar equation, change in income over time is given by this true survival probability divided by the empirical survival probability. And then we'd have a times one plus the actual investment return, assuming it's an effective rate, divided by one plus the assumed investment return. And those are all the assumed returns within the um, annuity, uh, the annuity calculation, the expected present value of annuity. But then if we do that, if we add in random investment returns, we end up mixing up um, idiosyncratic longevity risk and returns. And we just want to focus on longevity risk here, the idiosyncratic part of it. And there's no systematic longevity risk assumed. OK, so we're, by assuming constant investment returns, we focus only on that. Now, we are going to do two things here. We are going to have a measure of income volatility, and it's not going to be the standard deviation of income volatility. We're going to do something that is, in my view, more informative, and we want a measure of volatility. And what we're going to see is that within this special case of a single cohort, and everybody has the same, um, same age and the same distribution of deaths, that we actually have a very explicit relationship between this particular measure of income volatility and the heterogeneity measure. And through that, we're going to see that actually what really matters is just you've got the numbers of people in the fund, right? So we're going to just comment on that as we go along. And I think I have to speed up a bit, otherwise I'm not going to get finished, right? So don't worry too much if um, you don't take in these equations here on this page. So basically the measure of income volatility we're going to look at is we don't want the income to draw to drop very much. Now we can't, we're not controlling the income, we're just observing it, right? So we're just going to observe um, we're going to pick some, sorry, I'll start, we're going to pick some lower bound, right? So here we're saying, let's pick 95% um, of the initial income. And we're taking the initial income as very important to the customer because that's what they've been told. You're going to get this initial income 
and it may fluctuate a bit, you may be told it might increase in a, in a different pool to fund setting, but basically it's a very important number for them. And in this case, we're looking at uh, trying to pay them a level income. So let's allow for the fact the income is likely to have some fluctuations around that initial income, but let's see how long it's really fairly stable and doesn't drop by more than 5%, right? And we're just going to observe down each sample path for how long is that income above 95% of the initial income. Now, in some simulations, it might be for 25 years. In another simulation, it might be 18 years. In another simulation, 23 years. So um, what we can do is try to find in say, in this case, we're going to just fix this 90%. We're going to see for how long is that income above 95% of the initial income What's the maximum time it will be above 95% initial income in 90% of the scenarios, right? So let, I'll just put in a number here because it's probably easier because there's too many 90%, 95%, right? So let's say we find this maximal time was 20 years. That means that 90% of future scenarios, 90% of the time, the income stays above 95% of the initial income for 20 years, right? So I know it's a, it's a lot to take in. Um, that there, but that's that's what we're going to use. So it's really telling us that it's really quite stable, the income. Um, it doesn't fall by more than 5% in 90% of the scenarios for 20 years, if that was a number. Oops, we've jumped, oh, it's jumping around. I don't know why it's jumping. Stop. Okay. I think we've gone too far here. Right. Okay. Now this is a this is an important graph for understanding this heterogeneity, right? So we have here a plot of this number of years for which the income is above 95%. Now, it starts at age, it's assuming people start at age 70, so everybody here is age 70. And we're looking at a funds where, where they have different initial amounts of people, right? So it's going from about 10 here, you can't, you can't really see it, but we have here in the horizontal axis the initial number of participants in the fund going from about 10 up to 10,000. And then on the vertical axis, we have the number of years for which the income stays above 95% of the initial income. And you may have seen this chart before in, in some earlier webinars you might have seen, um, but you see this chart, the number of years for which the income doesn't fall by more than 5% of the initial income, right? So it stays above 95%. The number of years for which it does that in 90% of the scenarios increases dramatically from uh, about having 10 members to 1,000, and then it's still increasing, but it just gets slow, more slowly increasing, right? So it's like a logarithmic function. And so we see at the, when you've got a fairly small number of people, right? So it's all relative here, right? So you've got fewer than a thousand. There's big, big gains to be made in terms of the number of years for which this income is stable. And this is where this um, heterogeneity will matter a lot when you've got not many people, because um, what we'll see is that there's a very strong relationship between this number of years for which the income is stable. In fact, we can write down a relationship, the number of years between um, for which the income is stable, so it's above this 95% of um, the initial income and 90% of the scenarios. There's a strong relationship between that and the heterogeneity measure, but they're very sensitive, right? The number of years and the heterogeneity measures we'll see shortly are very sensitive um, to the number of members, the total number of members in the fund. And so when there's heterogeneity with a small number of members, you move up and down this line at, um, at the start here very easily. And that's going to affect the number of years. Whenever you have many more people in the fund, heterogeneity doesn't really matter very much because even if you had, say, um, you had a fund with 10,000 people, but, you know, let's say, it's hard to say what's moderate drop. Let's say a moderate amount of heterogeneity, maybe that moves you down to being similar to a fund in which you've got 5,000 people here who are all the same. Maybe it's similar to being a fund with 5,000 people who are the same, where you've actually got 10,000 people here who are different. But in terms of the number of years for which the income is stable, it doesn't change it by very much, right? Because we've just got the slower change as we, as we have the number of people. So we've got, maybe just skip this and the next one, interest in time. So, our measure of heterogeneity for those who are interested, right? So the heterogeneity measure, we're, we're looking at the characteristics of the people in the fund. And through the study we through the study I did, um, basically what we can do is we can look at the, the uh, profile of the people when the fund is set up, right? For the single cohort fund, and that will tell us um, how many people will, um, 
uh, sorry, for how long the, the income is stable, the number of years for which the income is stable, we can calculate that. And we have an express expression for that um, through the, which is seen in the paper of um, myself and Thomas Bernhardt. And then Thomas Bernhardt went on with one of his MSc students to extend that to a group in which there are people of different amounts of wealth, right? But a measure of heterogeneity will depend on the chances of death of the people among the membership, the number of them, um, and their wealth values, right? And this is how we um, calculate it. And it originally comes from a study done in an early paper of mine with some co-authors, um, uh, Montserrat Guillen and Jens Bert Nielsen, where we, um, in that paper, we're studying the volatility of the effectively the account values. And this was this is derived from the volatility of the account values that's due to um, fluctuations in the longevity credits, the deaths in the fund. So it does come, it doesn't, it isn't just a made-up thing, it comes from actually income volatility. Now, if we looked at this measure of heterogeneity in a in the simple fund where everybody's the same, so the stormtrooper case, then the measure of heterogeneity just reduces to one over the initial number of people in the fund. And it, and as you'll see here, this is a chart just showing you that it's like a one over X graph, right? So nothing, nothing amazing here. So we've got the initial number of people in the fund here going from, so it's just above zero, so about 10 people up to 10,000 and what the heterogeneity measure looks like. Now, within this setting of a, of a single cohort fund, um, and everybody's the same age and the same distribution of deaths, right? So single cohort fund, same age, same distribution of death. If I have a different group of people, right, they can look quite different, but if they have the same heterogeneity measure value, and, and it will be calculated differently if you have people with different fund values, if they have a different heterogeneity measure, um, sorry, if they have different, they look different, but they have the same heterogeneity measure value, say, um, a group of people here all the same who are say size a thousand, right? So that, so if you have people here all the same, there's a thousand of them, their heterogeneity measure will be one over a thousand. So point zero zero one. If you've got another group with people with different account values, but the same age, same future distribution of deaths, and they have the same value of heterogeneity point zero zero one, then their income will be stable for exactly the same number of years in 90% of scenarios or whatever percentage of scenarios you want to calculate. Right, so same heterogeneity measure means you have the same um, number of years for which the income is stable. Right, so that's that's what we'll see. And so how so how do these things relate? Well, actually, we have an explicit expression. So instead of going and doing simulations to determine this, we have a way of of relating that. So. Um, again, in the interest of time, we, we won't um, look at this really. But basically, the summary from this page is that we have a relationship between the heterogeneity measure. Your choice of, of it is at 90% of future scenarios or could be something else. We're looking at 95% of the, of the initial income as a, as a lower bound. We could change that to something else. And we have our heterogeneity um, value that we calculate by looking at the membership, their account values, um, the number of them and so on. We calculate this function where phi is our, uh, our standard normal distribution function. And we say that's, that's equal to our, um, someone who's age X, the same age as the, as the members of this fund. Um, we set that equal to TQX, right? So the chance of someone who's age X dying within the next T years. And then by looking up a suitable life table, whatever the life table is suitable for the membership, we can calculate this T, right? So the right-hand side here, we calculate as a number. We can easily calculate that. We can do it in Excel. We choose our, our life table and we know X, right? So we know our fund. We know who's in the fund. We've assumed they're all the same age. We can find T from a life table. So what's this telling you is that as long as they've got the same life table, if, if they've got the same value of H, then they'll have the same value of T right? The same number of years for which the income, in this case, is above 95% of initial income, 90% of future scenarios. So I'm going to um, probably finish, I'll probably skip the next one, right? But um, so let's look at a fund where we've got, say, a thousand people, and some of them are rich, and some of them are poor. But the rich people, we're going to look at different um, lines here, where the rich people are increasingly more, more wealthy. 
So let's just look in the graph on the left hand side. So we have number of people, number of rich people out of a thousand. So we've got a thousand people in the fund at time zero, no one else joins. And let's look at say a um, hundred rich people out of a thousand. And let's say we'll just go up here to this dotted line. That means that those rich people are four times richer than the poor people. In other words, it's, a, it's an individual account value. So each rich person is, has four times the account value of each poor person. And if there are 100 uh, people in the fund, then we can calculate the heterogeneity measure, and that's about 0 0.0015, reading off the, the chart, the vertical axis on the chart. So what does that mean, right? So this is probably where I'm going a bit too fast here, right? So this table on the right is coming from a fund in which everybody was the same, right? So there's no heterogeneity among the membership, but it was still single cohort, everybody was the same age and the same age is in the graph on the, on the left. And what's driving the number of years for which the income is stable is this heterogeneity measure, right? So if you have a thousand people who are all the same, their heterogeneity measure is 0 0.001, one over a thousand, and we can calculate, say, the income is stable, sorry, the income is um, above 90% of the initial income for 90% of future scenarios for 26 years in that case. If we add a bit more heterogeneity, right? So we looked at that, that 100 people having four times the account value of each of the per people, then their heterogeneity measure is about 0 0.0015. That pushes us a little bit between the, the funds where we have 500 and 1,000 people. But we can see just by a, the change in values in terms of the number of years for which the income is stable, um, it's going to drop between probably one to, to two years, depending on which income bound we're looking at. So we're looking at 80% of the initial income, alpha is 0.8 or 90% or 95%, right? So it's gonna change it by a couple of years. And um, we can look at more people in the fund. We actually see the chart on the left looks exactly the same, right? As the chart where we had a thousand members in total. And what's that's telling us, probably we're too fast here, but what's that's, what is that telling us is this is why I'm saying it's a number of people that matter more than the, um, the heterogeneity in the fund. The heterogeneity in the fund will really matter a lot when you have a very small number of people who are extremely wealthy. But if you don't have that, if you have kind of average heterogeneity, um, probably not as heterogeneous as what we're seeing here. And these charts, at least for the, the four, six, eight times uh, as wealthy people. So perhaps we're really just living down here. What really matters is the number of people more than that, because the heterogeneity measures are changing by a factor of 10 each time, right? So if you look in the chart here, you've got 100 people who are all the same. The heterogeneity factor is 0 0.01. It's going to 0 0.001 when you've got 10 times as many, and you've got 10 times as many, 10,000 people, it's going down by another factor of, of 10. Right, so heterogeneity only matters when the total grip size is small, right? So we get the largest pulling gains when the grip size is small. And that goes back to that chart I showed you of the, the initial number of people in the fund and the number of years for which the income is stable. So we're, whenever we've got a small number of people, that um, steep change in the number of years for which the income is stable is mirrored by the steep change in the heterogeneity measure. Remember that one over X graph, it's just mirror, a mirror of that. And it matters when we've got a small proportion of extremely wealthy people, right? But if we don't have that, it, it's, it's more important to have, just have people in the fund. We also studied the closing of the pool dignity fund. So we looked at um, uh, a group of people who had different ages joining the fund, but we had more, more say, 60, a lot of 65 year olds, fewer 66 year olds in proportion to the survival probability from age 65 to 66, fewer 67 year olds adjusted in the account value similarly. So the 65 year olds had the most money, 66 year olds less and so on. And while the results um, for the study I just showed you where everybody's the same age don't quite exactly hold, we saw a similar kind of picture that basically it matters the numbers in the fund more than the, um, the actual heterogeneity. Again, if you've got a small number of people, heterogeneity matters. But if you have a very small number of people, like you know, less than a thousand, you should consider whether you're doing adequate pulling and maybe you should consider um, some additional solution to try to improve longevity pulling. Right, so I'm going to finish there because I've gone over, over the time I should be talking. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. And if you're interested in finding out more, because I know it's quite technical and I went pretty fast towards the end of it, um, you can look up some of the papers here and the, uh, the paper relating to um, 
this here work should shortly appear on the website as well. So I will stop there and hand over to Keelan. Thank you, Catherine. Um, lots of questions and thanks very much for your presentation. I understand there's a lot of detail. So just, I think someone asked in the chat, we will be sharing the slides afterwards and people can go through it and come back with questions. It's not a problem, but maybe we'll take five minutes, Catherine, for a few questions, if you don't mind. Um, okay, where will I go? Adrian Bolding. Hi, Adrian. Adrian's asked a couple of questions that are interesting, I think. Um, when you were working out Han Solo's new income in your model, the Star Wars one, which I loved, by the way, do you update <laughs> the assumptions used to calculate AX? Yes. Keep the same assumptions you used at entry? You, 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 you would update it, right? So we've assumed a very sort of rigid model. Um, but yeah, you would update it over time. So that's one of the um, other well we might see it as an advantage updating the assumptions over time if you look at the deliverable we've done on the um, involving systematic longevity risk we assume in that that the assumptions are updated over time the annuity um, calculations are updated over time so yeah we do update it over time in line with how mortality is evolving but in this case we have a, a we don't have any systematic longevity risk so it's kind of doesn't matter but we do have that uh, deliverable where we where we look at it and still the income is really very stable um with that you do see a build up of systematic longevity risk over time mm -hmm. for the last generations but it's also compounded by the fact that the last generations in such a scheme they end up they're in a good situation for say their first 20 30 years for this the longer lived people and um, they're good situation because they have all the previous uh, generations in the scheme but they are dying off and then it ends up the last generation, if you don't do anything, they'll end up, there's not very many of them uh, at their own age, at their old age. And old age, you really need longevity pulling at the old age. That's when it really, really matters. And um, they have nobody to pull their risk with, their longevity risk. So it's so you can't just run these things into the ground. Like you have to do something um, to improve that pulling at the older ages. Mm. Yes, we, we would update it over time if we were doing a more realistic model for this. But we're just studying one particular aspect of it. Okay, cool. Uh, I have a question here from Peter Telford. How does this model cope with changes in assumed future longevity, i.e. what if P is now different from P at entry, et cetera? Uh, so this, so again, this relates to, this is just a model to try and, it is like a sort of like say an academic model basically, because we're just trying, just trying to understand does heterogeneity ma matter? Um, Again, if you want to uh, look at something where we do have changes in the assumed future longevity, that's the model with the systematic longevity risk. So we can we can do all of this. We can cope with all of that. That's not an issue. Um, and you can look at that paper. We just update our uh, annuity values effectively. That's how it will be manifested within the model. Um, we update our annuity values over time in line with how we see mortality evolving. Mm. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Um, I have another one here from Kevin Westbroom. Should a pooled annuity fund undertake underwriting of individuals who are joining? Um, yes, yeah, so it's a it's a great question, Kevin. Um, I know other funds haven't bothered to do it, so I think I don't say bother is probably the wrong word, right? But you don't want to put people off, I guess. Um, so I guess it just depends. Um, of course, underwriting always incurs a cost, so it's a balance between do you think you're able to assess the mortality of people without underwriting well enough or or not and that's what i, I i'm I, I don't know about basically okay but it's a great good question it is a good question maybe we can come back to it um i'll take another one here another one from peter i know peter has um quite a few questions but we can have a discussion after but i think this one was interesting on slide 27 how do we recognize that different members have different risk appetites i.e. one might want 90% confidence, 95% income, someone else might, might want 99 confidence, 75 income, etc. So, okay, this is, a, so what we're doing here is we're not controlling this um, in terms of the risk appetite. Mm. We're just observing the income. So we're just running a simulation and we're just observing when does income fall below these um, particular chosen income bounds. And we can change the income bounds we look at. We can change the confidence intervals, this you know, percentage of the, of the simulations. So we can just change that. And of, and of course, if we're running a general fund, we're just going to have to make a general assumption to, to sell it basically about what we think are here are potential customers and what would be their risk appetite. Um, there'll also be the investment strategy, right? So that's going to have an impact as well, like a rather large impact on the volatility and any risk management around that. Um, so 
we can recognize that but but basically i think ultimately um yeah you you can't you you're you probably well can you really offer everybody an extremely tailored investment fund i mean mm. probably probably not we just have to make some assumptions and see if people will invest in it or not um Thank you, Catherine. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. There are other questions and uh, we will come back to those people who haven't had their question answered after the session. So I want to quickly thank you, Catherine, for a really good presentation today and thank everybody who logged in. Um, just as we close, you'll probably have a survey link pop up on your screen. Um, and if you could please complete that, we'd be very grateful. Uh, but as I say, yes, we'll pick up the other questions and no doubt this topic will keep rolling on. And thanks very much, Catherine and the panelists, and we'll see you the next time. Thank you. Thank you.